Our gospel reading for this morning comes from the gospel of Luke chapter 24. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day, the day that Jesus was raised from the dead, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In C.S. Lewis's series of books, The Chronicles of Narnia, there's a character which serves as a Christ figure for the story. His name's Aslan, and he appears usually as a large lion. And it's characteristic of this Aslan throughout the series that he comes and goes as he pleases. They never are quite sure when he's going to show up, and they never know for how long he's going to stay once he gets there, and they never can quite predict what it is he's going to do while he's around. He's somewhat unpredictable. When one of the characters asks another character about, about this, about why this is, the answer he gets is this. Well, Aslan is not a tame lion. There's a wildness to him. There's an unpredictability about him. And as I was reading our gospel story this morning, I couldn't help but have that quote running through my head. In this story, Jesus is not a tame lion. He's somewhat unpredictable. It's hard to explain just why he does what he does when he does it. Our story starts off in a familiar enough place, I think. It starts off in a place of disappointment, a place of sadness. These two disciples, well, they're leaving. They are leaving Jerusalem. They're on their way to this village called Emmaus, maybe just a stop on their way back to wherever home was before Jesus caught their attention. They've waited three days now since he was crucified, and they've given up hope. They had hoped that this Jesus would be the Messiah, that this Jesus would be the one to set Israel free, to drive out the Romans, to restore justice and peace to the Jewish government. And yet, 
He was crucified by the Romans, handed over by those Jewish rulers, betrayed by the very people who should have welcomed him the most. Their hope is lost, and so they're leaving. They've given up. This chapter in their life has ended, so it seems. And as they're walking, they're discussing with each other. They're trying to make sense of what just happened. How could they have been so sure about this Jesus only to have him taken away from them all too quickly, having accomplished nothing, so it seems. And as they're walking, a stranger comes up. And that's normal, of course. It's safer to travel in groups in those days. And so, as he walks with them, they tell him about what they're talking about. And as they discuss with him, it becomes clear that this isn't an ordinary man. There's more to this man than meets the eye, because he seems to know somehow more about this Jesus that they have been following than they do. Even though he seems oblivious to the events which just happened in the city of Jerusalem, he knows more about the Messiah and how these events are necessary even. And as he walks them through the scriptures, it becomes clear that this is somebody that they want to know more about. So they invite him to stay with them. And as he breaks the bread and blesses it, something Jesus must have done with his disciples countless times, finally they recognize him. Their eyes are opened, it says. They see him for who he is. They realize that this is their Lord Jesus, risen from the dead. And as soon as they recognize him, he vanishes from their sight. So even though night's approaching, they go the seven miles back to Jerusalem. I don't know if they walk or run. They seem excited, though. And when they get there with the other disciples gathered back under one roof, all of the disciples back together, Jesus once again appears to them seemingly out of nowhere and gives them his message of peace. Peace be with you, he says. And if I were those disciples, in fact, just as a reader of the story, I find myself asking, why? Why does Jesus do what he does when he does it? I mean, why did Jesus wait so long in the first place? He's been out of the tomb since early in the morning, we know that, and yet he's waited so long that two of his disciples, two of the people who have been following him, have left the city. They've abandoned hope already. And when he does come to them, why does he do it in such a strange way? Why is he hidden from them? Why doesn't he just let them know who he is right away, save them the walk all the way to Emmaus, perhaps? And then when they do recognize him, he just vanishes. He disappears from their sight. They no longer see him. How come it happens in this way? And the answer maybe is something like that answer we get in those Chronicles of Narnia books. Jesus is not a tame lion. There's something different about the way he thinks. There's something different about the way he acts. He's hard to predict. There's a wildness, almost a playfulness to the way he hides and is found again by these disciples. But that question of why is a question that I think we're quite familiar with. I don't think many of us have to go back very far to get to a time where we found ourselves asking why. Why did God do this and not that? Why was God in this one place and not in another? We can ask that in good times, but we especially ask that in hard times. Why has God blessed this family with a loving family, able to get along with material wealth, and this other family just down the street doesn't seem to have any of that? Why does God seem to bring healing to some while to others they succumb to their illness? Why does God seem to miraculously intervene in some cases while in other cases it seems that he just stands idly by if he's there at all? Why is God doing what he does and not what we would like him to do? And maybe the only answer we have is that he's not a tame lion. He's wild, he's unpredictable, his ways are not our ways. As the saying goes, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And as true as all that is, it's not always all that helpful to the person who's questioning, to the person who's wrestling with anxiety, with doubts about God's presence 
God's presence with us, God's presence for us. Sometimes those answers don't come as we'd like them to. There's two things in this story that stick out to me. The first is that from these two disciples' perspective, Jesus is absent almost the entire story. As far as these two disciples can tell, Jesus is with them very little in this story. From the moment they leave Jerusalem to the moment they go running back into Jerusalem, there's only one small second and a half, maybe, where they are aware of Jesus' presence with them in that breaking of the bread before he disappears from their sight. But from our perspective, from the reader's perspective, from Jesus' perspective, almost exactly the opposite is true. Jesus is present with them almost the entire story, even if they don't realize that. His presence is hidden from them, but he is present nonetheless. He's present on that whole walk, those seven miles to Emmaus. He's present as he opens scriptures to them, as they tell him their troubles. He's present with them in the supper as it's being prepared. He's present with them as he breaks bread when they recognize him, and even after they recognize him and he disappears, we're not told that he goes anywhere. We're just told that he vanishes. Literally, he becomes invisible, unseen. And since when they get back to Jerusalem, he's immediately there with them again, you wonder if maybe he was with them that whole journey back to Jerusalem as well, even if they didn't know about it. Jesus' presence is throughout this story, even though it is hidden. And I think that's true for us as well. The other thing I notice about this story is that Jesus' presence, Jesus' hidden presence, is hidden in order to be found. Jesus seems to hide himself just to be found later on. Jesus is hidden with them on the road so that he can be found in the breaking of the bread. And Jesus hides himself there so that they run back and are reunited with the other disciples. If Jesus had stuck around, probably they would have too. But by hiding himself, he can be found in the group, by the whole group, all his disciples under one roof, gathered together again. Jesus hides himself in order to be found in this story. And I think that's true in all our stories as well. God is present with us. God's presence is hidden only so that we can find God's presence again. Jesus may not be a tame lion, but he is a trustworthy one. Jesus may be unpredictable and a bit wild, but he always keeps his promises. Promises like this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Or this one, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am with them. Or this one, of course, this is my body, this is my blood, broken and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Even though Jesus may be hidden from our sight, these promises, among many others, still stand firm. So, therefore, come to the table to the breaking of bread, to the place where Jesus has promised to be. All you who are doubting God's presence for you, all you who are asking God why, all you whose eyes are being held shut like the eyes of those two disciples, come. Come and receive Jesus hidden in this very ordinary bread and wine. Come and find the one who gives rest to the weary and peace to those who are troubled Come and receive Christ's presence hidden here to give you the forgiveness of sins, to nourish your soul, and to sustain you unto eternal life. He's hidden himself here in plain sight, so come and find him.